Hey everybody, welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off talking about the eukaryotes and endosymbiosis. If you haven't already watched the previous lecture about endosymbiosis, please make sure you check that one out before you get into this one. So just as a very quick recap of endosymbiosis, remember the rough translation of that is inside together living. And, and so endosymbiosis is defined as when an organism of one species lives inside the cells of another species. And we talked about this theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts, two unique organelles that the eukaryotes have, evolved from this process of endosymbiosis, where a eukaryotic precursor type cell engulfed a prokaryotic organism that could do aerobic cellular respiration, and that gave rise to a mitochondrion. And then that cell that already had mitochondria engulfed a prokaryotic organism that could do photosynthesis, and that organism, after this process of endosymbiosis, became chloroplasts. And that gave rise to photosynthetic eukaryotes and these other uh, precursor cells that engulfed uh, mitochondria gave rise to the typical eukaryotic cell that can't do photosynthesis but can do aerobic cellular respiration through the use of its mitochondria. And we looked at um, this sort of idea that chloroplasts and mitochondria evolved through endosymbiosis and the evidence for that in that chloroplasts and mitochondria both have, so these organelles that are in eukaryotic cells, both have bacterial-like characteristics in the sense that if you look at a mitochondria and a chloroplast, they have circular chromosomes. If you look at a mitochondria or a chloroplast, they have their own genome. that's a circular chromosome. They have a double cell wall that you'd predict if they were engulfed by another uh, cell. And they also replicate by binary fission, which is exactly what prokaryotic cells do. So given that, which of the following groups contain circular DNA in their, or in their genome? If you said both, you are correct. So prokaryotes have circular DNA. The majority or all of their DNA is circular. Whereas eukaryotes, they have linear DNA in the nucleus. But in things like chloroplasts and mitochondria, they will have circular DNA. So eukaryotic cells have both linear DNA and circular DNA. And actually, if you look at the cellular level processes of photosynthesis and the cellular level process of respiration, and you compare, so there's prokaryotes that can do photosynthesis, and there's prokaryotes that can do cellular respiration, and there's eukaryotes that can do photosynthesis, and eukaryotes that can do cellular respiration. And those eukaryotes do those processes in their mitochondria. So they do cellular respiration in the mitochondria, and they do photosynthesis in the chloroplasts. And if you look at on the sort of subcellular level, uh, the actual sort of chemical process of photosynthesis and the chemical process of cellular respiration, they're remarkably similar in the way that prokaryotes do it and the way that eukaryotes do it. And so which of these diagrams best do you think explains why photosynthesis and cellular respiration, those chemical processes, are so, so, so similar in bacteria and eukarya? Okay, so if you said C, that is the correct answer. So the idea here is that the actual chemical processes of cellular respiration, the actual chemical process of photosynthesis, the ability to do those processes evolved initially in bacteria. And then those bacteria that could do either cellular respiration or photosynthesis were engulfed by eukarya through this process of endosymbiosis, okay? And so those traits were horizontally transferred across the branches of this sort of major phylogenetic tree via this process of endosymbiosis. And so C actually best depicts this process, or it best explains why those traits of cellular respiration and photosynthesis are so similar between the bacteria and eukarya. It's horizontal gene transfer. So the genes that encode the ability to do cellular respiration, encode the ability to do photosynthesis, those genes that encode those traits evolved in bacteria, and then those bacteria, when they're engulfed, carried their genes with them into the eukaryotes, and then those eukaryotes that did that endosymbiotic process passed those genes and those traits on to their offspring and subsequent lineages. 
And so endosymbiosis is actually a rare example of horizontal gene transfer in the eukaryotes. And so I want to be clear here. Eukaryotes can't readily do horizontal gene transfer. They can't do horizontal gene transfer like we see in the prokaryotic organisms where you have these processes of transduction and, trans, uh, and conjugation um, where you can actually pass genes in between individuals in real time. But occasionally, eukaryotes, once in every few billion years, this process of endosymbiosis can occur. And that is an example, actually, of horizontal gene transfer, although it's very, 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 very extremely rare for the eukaryotes. And so if you put this sort of into the larger picture, thinking about the tree of life, so we've talked about these three major domains, and if we think about this sort of phylogenetic tree of life and way to organize them where the eukaryotes are more closely related to the archaea and they share a common ancestor somewhere in the past, and these two groups share a common ancestor with bacteria somewhere in the past, the tree of life is actually probably more accurately described as a web of life, so to speak, where you actually have lots of different connections across these different major lineages thanks to horizontal gene transfer. So for example, in this figure right here, we're looking at the bacteria in blue, the archaea in green, and the eukaryotic, major eukaryotic groups in red. And what you can see is there's some spots here where you have lineages connecting across the tree. So not just a unique group that gave rise to the eukaryotes, but also some genetic information and some groups that helped contribute to the rise of the eukaryotic groups that actually came over from these bacterial lineages. And so this is an example of horizontal gene transfer, and it's represented by endosymbiosis, okay? So remember, there were some organisms that gave rise to plants and the ability to do photosynthesis, and that's through the endosymbiosis of bacteria that could do photosynthesis. And so those traits and those genes carried over to this side of the tree. And same deal with mitochondria. Somewhere back there, there was a uh, prokaryotic organism that was engulfed in endo, through endosymbiosis and became part of this eukaryotic lineage. And so you have an example of genes and traits being transferred across the tree. So let's talk about some of the actual applications of this idea of endosymbiosis and the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own genomes. So remember, um, if you think about a fertilized egg in a human being, that fertilized egg came from an egg and a sperm cell. And as it turns out, those egg cells, they have their own mitochondria. So the mother contributes an egg, the father contributes a sperm, those sperm and egg come together, and if you look at the fertilized egg, all of the mitochondria, or the vast, 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 vast majority of the mitochondria in that fertilized egg, that's the very first cell that forms the offspring, have mitochondria only from the mom. And so what this means is the mitochondria in their own little independent circular DNA that they have are only passed down from the mother. So the mother contributes the egg cell, the egg cell contributes to the mitochondria, and those mitochondria all reproduce to produce all of the cells in the offspring's body. And so you can actually look at the mitochondria in offspring and trace them all the way back to the mother. So for example, if you have a mom up here at the top of this family tree, and she has a daughter, a son, and a daughter, that daughter, son, and daughter are all going to have the same mitochondria as this mother. And then those daughters are going to pass those same mitochondria with the same genomes off to their offspring, such that if you look at the mitochondria of these males and these offspring here that come from these females, you can trace those same mitochondria back to the mom, these same mitochondria back to the mom, and all the way back even to the grandmother. And so these offspring will have the same mitochondria as this grandmother back here. And this has actually been applied by the scientist named Marie Claire King, who developed this basically lineal tracing um, that's been used to match uh, grandchildren to grandparents. Um, and this was really important um, for the Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo. So these were women um, from Argentina who had a basically, there was a giant civil war that broke out there where uh, basically a generation of mothers were separated from their children and the mothers ended up passing away and the children were left alone without the grandmothers. And the grandmothers wanted to get those grandchildren back so that they could take care of them. But the government essentially said, we will not give you those grandchildren back 
unless you can prove to us that they are your grandchildren. And so this woman, Marie Claire King, said, I can prove that if I look at the DNA sequences in the mitochondria, and I can mass the match the DNA sequences in the grandmothers to the DNA sequences in the mitochondria of the, of the grandchildren, and prove that with 100% certainty those grandchildren, or at least 99.99999% certainty that those grandchildren must have come from those grandmothers and actually got a lot of different grandchildren back into the homes of those grandmothers. So this is a great application of this idea of endosymbiosis and the fact that mitochondria have their own genomes. Another great application of mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA is DNA barcoding, which you guys are doing. So if you think about DNA barcoding, you guys are probably learning this week the DNA barcoding uses a portion, if you're DNA barcoding plants, of the chloroplast gene RBCL to ID plants. And that RBCL gene comes from the chloroplast. So if you're looking at a plant cell here, these are the green things are the chloroplast. They have their own genomes. And the RBL, RBCL gene is a gene that's in those chloroplasts. In addition, if you're barcoding animals, animals all have mitochondria in their cells. And so we use a portion of the mitochondrial gene, MTCO1, or the CO1 or cytochrome oxidase 1 gene to ID animals. And so if you look at the mitochondria here in this cell, so plant cells have mitochondria. In addition, animal cells have mitochondria. And so we use the CO1 from animal cells. And basically it's just a gene within that mitochondrial circular DNA or that mitochondrial genome that we can use to ID these different organisms. That's the DNA that we're sequencing. So why does DNA barcoding use DNA from chloroplasts and DNA from mitochondria instead of the nuclear DNA that exists in those eukaryotic cells? So why use these regions? Well, number one, they're present in all eukaryotes. So all eukaryotes have mitochondrial cells. Um, and all plants have RBCL cells or they have chloroplasts. And so they're present in all the cells that we look at. And on top of that, they're present in lots and lots of copies, okay? So if you're looking at nuclear DNA and you're coding a region in there, you only have one nucleus and you only have one copy of that region in the nucleus. Whereas if you look at a eukaryotic plant cell, there's lots of chloroplasts in there, and so there's a lot more copies of that region, of that RBCL gene, in that cell. And so if you have a lot more copies of it, you have a better chance of making more copies of that through this PCR process that you guys are working on. Same deal with mitochondria. There's lots of mitochondria within a cell. And so if you have lots of mitochondria there, there's lots of copies of the CO1 region, and it increases your chances of being able to amplify that DNA just because there's lots of copies of it within each cell. And in addition, they figured out that these regions have the appropriate rates of molecular evolution. So what do I mean when I say the appropriate rates of molecular evolution? What is molecular evolution? Well, if you go back to this idea of speciation where you have a parent population down here that splits into two different populations and eventually different species through the accumulation of unique mutations and unique alleles in these two populations. And then you have population B over time splitting again and the accumulation of more unique alleles and uh, uh, mutations between B and C such that these populations are diverging genetically over time to become different species, A, B, and C. And so the idea here is if you look at the barcoding region of the mitochondria in this parent population, over time, unique mutations will accumulate in this barcoding region. So this is a sequence of DNA, and all those colors represent the different A's, T's, and G's, and C's in that DNA sequence. And if we look at A, it stays the same, so this is still population A. And B, we'll see changes accumulating in that DNA sequence of the barcoding region, such that if we compare the barcoding region of this CO1 or cytochrome oxidase 1 DNA sequence from the mitochondria, so we've made a barcode of that sequence of this region of the mitochondrial DNA, and we compare the sequence of this one from population B or species B, and this barcode from population A, the sequences will be different over time, so they'll change over time such we can tell species B from species A. And if we go on to species A versus B versus C, C will be even more different. So when we compare these sequences of this barcoding region, we can say this is species A, this is species B, and this is species C because their barcoding regions are different enough to call them 
different species. So we can tell them apart. And all the members of population A will have this unique DNA barcode. All the members of population B will have this unique DNA barcode. And all the members of population C will have this unique DNA barcoding sequence. And this has been applied to a lot of sort of practical implications. So if things have been as simple or as sort of straightforward as looking at fish fraud um, in sushi and other sort of imported meats in fish markets, and it turns out that there's actually a lot of fraud and mislabeling of fish, and this has been figured out from DNA barcoding, just a little piece of that sushi and matching it up with barcoding sequences of known species to figure out that the tuna you bought is actually not tuna sometimes, and the salmon you bought is actually not salmon sometimes when we look at the barcoding sequences of that fish that's being sold. It's also being used to curb illicit trade in endangered plants. Um, so some people are selling endangered species of plants. We can figure out whether or not it's an endangered species um, when it's being mislabeled or if it's being mislabeled to hide the fact that it's an endangered species using DNA barcoding. And in addition, um, there's some new research that's coming out looking at bushmeat and the illegal trade of endangered species. And so bushmeat is basically people... Uh, in more rural areas will go into jungles and other regions and actually take animals directly out of the forest. So you can see chimpanzees here. So they'll collect those animals from the forest um, and they'll use them as a food source for meat. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can see obviously this is a chimpanzee, but sometimes all you find are just pieces of meat and people won't tell you what is that meat, what is it actually made out of. And so you can go into these marketplaces, get a little piece of meat, DNA barcode it, an idea to figure out whether endangered species are being taken from that area. And same, same deal with the illegal trade of endangered species. So here we're looking at rhino horns. So you can get a little DNA out of that rhino horn and you can figure out whether it's fake rhino horn, real rhino horn, what species it is, or other things. Obviously rhino horns, that's an endangered species, but you can figure out if other powders and things like that, once it's ground, ground up and doesn't really look like a horn anymore, is actually from an endangered species. And there's a lot of scientists in other countries that are using this DNA barcoding technique that you guys are using to answer these important conservation-related questions. And of course, you guys are using DNA barcoding in our 140 and Bio 150 labs to do local studies on biodiversity, where you guys have documented over 400 different species just in the Arboretum using DNA barcoding. We've also found eight local species of mosquitoes in some mosquito diversity surveys that people have done in Bio 150 um, lab. And we've also looked at fish mislabeling and found over 36 different species of fish um, in local markets. And actually some decent rates of fish mislabeling, which is unfortunate. Okay, so those are some practical applications of the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts um, evolve through this process of endosymbiosis and have their own genomes, their own circular DNA, independent of the nuclear DNA in eukaryotic cells. So given that, what's the answer to this question? Okay, if you said E, none of the above are true, you are correct, so part A, or choice A, Mitochondria appeared in eukaryotic cells after the chloroplast. That's actually false. So mitochondria were in uh, eukaryotic cells first before the chloroplast, and it was only later that we see uh, a eukaryotic cell that was a precursor to photosynthetic eukaryotic cells that already had mitochondria that then engulfed a prokaryotic, or I'm sorry, then engulfed um, a prokaryotic cell that could do photosynthesis that became a chloroplast. And so Mitochondria were first engulfed, and then chloroplasts were. Mitochondria evolved from an anaerobic prokaryote that could only do fermentation. This is a false statement. It evolved from an aerobic prokaryote that could do cellular respiration. Remember, the whole point here is the prokaryote that gave rise to mitochondria can do cellular aerobic cellular respiration, which produces a ton, a ton, a ton of ATP compared to other metabolic processes like fermentation. And that's why it's so advantageous to have mitochondria. Mitochondria evolved independently by convergent evolution on the bacterial and eukaryotic branches of the tree. No, this is not convergent evolution. It's actually a very rare example of horizontal gene transfer. Um, via this process of endosymbiosis. And so once again, eukaryotic organisms cannot do horizontal gene transfer. Typically, this is a very, very rare 
uh, endosymbiosis is a very, very rare example of horizontal gene transfer that occurred in eukaryotes only once or twice in the last billion years or so. And mitochondria ultimately decrease the amount of ATP that eukaryotic cells can produce. That's false. They increase the amount of ATP that you, uh, eukaryotic cells can produce, and that's because mitochondria do cellular respiration. Um, without this process of cellular respiration, which do, produces a ton, a ton of ATP relative to other metabolic processes, uh, eukaryotic cells just wouldn't be able to produce as much ATP as they can.